करणे Ready? All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Everybody can take their seats. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, this is our last session, technical session, session eight, uh, program delivery. And I'll go ahead and get started. All right, so today we're having a presentation um, from Jonathan Yee and I'll, from Cobb County DOT, and I'll go ahead and read his bio. Jonathan was born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area and received a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of California, Irvine, and a master's in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. He has 17 years of experience in the transportation industry, collect 16.5 um, of those in California and the last six months in Georgia. Between 2006 and 2014, he worked as a consultant in Los Angeles, um, completing projects related to development, traffic impact analysis, signal synchronization, and signal design. Between 2014 and 2020, he served as the city traffic engineer for the city of uh, Burbank and <clears throat> oversaw all traffic-related activities um, to support public requests, development, engineering permit reviews, operations, and maintenance. Between, between 2020 and 2023, he served as the transportation manager to the city of Santa Clara in Northern California and oversaw all transportation management. Starting in 2023, he relocated to Atlanta to be the deputy director of Cobb County and oversees the management and delivery of the transportation program. Without further ado, Jonathan. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Jonathan Yee. Uh, seven months here in Georgia, and I think it's um, great to be here to see everyone with their families at the summer seminar. Uh, so just for my reference, how many of y'all are familiar with Cobb County? Okay, everyone. And um, how many of y'all are intimately involved with uh, developing a transportation program and also just delivering that program? OK, a few of you. Great. So hopefully you find some value uh, in my presentation. So first, we'll start with an overview. Um, today, I'll be presenting about an in, in a quick introduction to Cobb County, since I believe most of you are familiar with, with Cobb, uh, what's in a transportation program and how we develop it, and then how we deliver that program, and then future opportunities related to that. So a quick introduction, Cobb County is in northwest of the city of Atlanta. Uh, there's five board of commissioners that oversee the county. Uh, we have a population of about three quarters of a million people. Uh, there are seven cities in Cobb County. There's a, recently a new city of Mapleton, which is now being formed. I believe they did elect their mayor and council members, and they're actually in the process of forming uh, staff and new department. You're probably all aware, but uh, Cobb County does have six flags. Kennesaw State, which our commissioner Burrell is very proud that they made into the NCAA men's tournament this past year, and also home to Truist Park, the Atlanta Braves. I mean, on this orange graphic um, is a representation of the area of the Atlanta Regional Commission. That is our regional transportation planning agency that Cobb County is a part of, coordinate regularly with. I'm a part of the Cobb County Department of Transportation. The DOT is primarily responsible for the unincorporated areas of Cobb County. But we do perform operations and maintenance for select cities within the county, and we also are responsible for delivering uh, federally funded capital projects also for certain cities if they do not have the uh, GDOT LAP certification or a locally administered project. 
our department is structured with three specific divisions. Um, on, on the left of this graphic in the green is J.D. Lorenz, who's our deputy director overseeing uh, all operations and maintenance activities uh, within the county. So that's uh, maintaining roadways, litter cleanup, um, operating traffic signals, things of that nature. In the middle of the graphic in the blue is Carl Von Hagel. He's our deputy director overseeing uh, the airport. Cobb County does have an airport and our transit division. Cobb County has a transit group, uh, Cobb Link, which runs buses for the public. And to the right with the highlighted square is myself. Um, I oversee program management. Uh, uh, my group consists of engineering, which oversees uh, pre-construction, right-of-way, and construction related to project delivery. We have a planning division, which oversees programming and planning activities, as well as a right-of-way group to support um, engineering and planning. And now we're moving on to our transportation program. So what, what's, what's in Cobb County's transportation program? Here on the screen, there's various components. Um, Cobb County, we are responsible for about 250 bridges um, in our county. Um, in terms of drainage, uh, the DOT is responsible for all drainage in the uh, all drainage assets in the county as well. Uh, we have about 5.4 million miles of drainage pipe within our county, as well as about 9,500 drainage structures. Um, in terms of roadways, we're also involved in that aspect as well. Uh, Cobb County, we have about 2,500 centerline miles of roadways. Uh, also, various school zones, um, sidewalks, traffic signals, um, trails, and transit. On this picture is an example of a few projects we have in our county. Uh, the, lower, the lower right is a roundabout that we've, we've been moving to frequently in our county in terms of intersection upgrades. Uh, the top right is a multi-use trail or path uh, that we've frequently been designing and constructing alongside roadways within our county. And the picture there to the left is uh, what we call our uh, South Barrett Reliever Project. So this is actually a, a new arterial that's being constructed um, over Interstate 75 to relieve traffic on one of our major arterials, Barrett Parkway. And that's a project that Cobb County is leading with federal funds. Um, now that we've gone over the components of a transportation program, um, the first step is identifying needs. Um, in Cobb County, we break down the needs into two specific elements. Uh, the first one is maintaining a state of good repair. Uh, so that means essentially optimizing the condition of an asset. And in Cobb County, we do use GIS to store this data. So in terms of identifying needs in relation to an asset's condition, typically involves um, field inspections, observations, making a list of action items, and priori prioritizing that list of action items. So essentially, imagine you're just living in a house, you're walking through the house, and you're identifying all the little touch-ups and needs to maintain everything in your house in a state of good repair. Uh, that's something that we do for roadway paving, um, drainage structures, bridges, and things of that nature. Um, on this on the uh, lower left of this slide is, a, is an example of what Cobb County did to identify needs for our paving conditions. Uh, so we entered, entered into a contract in 2021 with a firm named D DTS. Uh, that firm used a van uh, with a bunch of equipment on it. They drove every centerline mile within our county and was were taking pictures along uh, while they were driving. Uh, from those pictures, we then used uh, combined that data with the ASTM standard and storing it with cartograph to then develop uh, the pavement condition index. And the map on the, on the right side is, in a, is a, a graphical display of what the pavement condition is in Cobb County, uh, with green being good and red being bad. Another key element in identifying needs for our transportation program in Cobb County is looking at connectivity and operations. So this is uh, specifically identifying needs related to uh, circulation, operations, and safety. Uh, we do this by identifying needs within long-range transportation plans. Um, in Cobb County, we have three specific plans that we follow. That's our comprehensive transportation plan, which we update on a regular basis. We also have a Greenways and Trails Master Plan, which looks at bike lanes, trails, and multi-use paths. And recently, this past, this past June, we completed a safety action plan, which uh, is heavily focused on looking at thousands of collisions within our county uh, looking at risk factors and trends, and looking at geographical hotspots and, and needs for those. In terms of transportation plans, uh, we do have a specific planning division that leads that effort, and uh, that consists of everything from uh, detailed scoping and needs analysis, where we look at data um, 
identify deficiencies from that data. We do extensive public outreach through meetings, or virtual, as well as translations if possible, and then wrap all that up into uh, potential strategies and, re strategies and recommendations. Um, the graphic on the right is a, is a map from our safety action plan where uh, red is bad, once again, green is good, and it's, this is showing the, the density of collisions within Cobb County, uh, red being a high density of collisions over a certain area. And you can see some clusters around Marietta and to the south, as well as just north, uh, north of the Cumberland Improvement District, which is a little bit to the right of that graphic. And from this data and this map, we actually use this to apply for a federal uh, safe, safe Systems for All approach federal grant this, uh, this year. Now that we've identified the needs, um, how do we complete the program? Well, now we need to fund, fund those needs to actually form the program. In Cobb County, we have our planning division staff, which leads this effort. Uh, they're actively going out and monitoring schedules for competitive sources of grants. This includes federal funding as well as regional. Uh, the ARC does have regional funding available on a regular cycle that, uh, that the region competes for. Um, there's also formula-based funds, so formula funds for anyone that doesn't know. It's an allocation of a funding source to a specific area, in this case Cobb County, based on a metric. Uh, I believe LMIG funds are based on roadway miles, but it could also be based on population. Um, some tips that we have for any public agencies is to regularly monitor schedules, to look for uh, call for projects for grants. That way you can line up your priorities with the grant funding cycle to be prepared in advance and you're not um, reacting to an email from a from an elected official or uh, your boss walks into the door and says, what's our plans for this call for projects? Uh, another tip is to uh, also collaborate with elected officials, um, internal staff as well as the public. That way your prioritized list is fully aligned with all the stakeholders and you, um, and you have a feasible scope of work and a realistic cost estimate so the engineers um, aren't upset at the planners who are applying for projects with unrealistic expectations. I'm um, putting all that together now that we have identified our needs and we have funding for those needs, we wrap that, we wrap that together into our capital improvement program. Um, at Cobb County, uh, we, we recently passed a special purpose local option sales tax, or SPLOS, um, in 2022. Uh, this is a six-year program that serves as, serves as the primary foundation for our CIP. There's approximately $330 million in transportation funding set aside up to 2027. And from this booklet or this program, we then supplement that funding with other sources, um, such as the competitive grants, or the formula grants that I had described earlier. Um, in Cobb County, we're a little bit unique in that what we've done with our SPLOS funds is we've actually carved out specific portion, I believe it. Uh, I believe it's 10% of the entire transportation program for what we call as shared needs. Um, in that category of shared needs, what we've done is we've hired an on-call uh, bench of consultants um, to actually support uh, via staff augmentation uh, to support various phases of that project, as well as to set aside funds for our maintenance group to actually do some early purchases of equipment and materials that can support various projects. So for example, um, our in-house road maintenance crew can buy uh, materials or buy equipment, and they can reuse that equipment over and over for very small drainage projects, for example. So the what we call shared costs would be our dedicated funding source for those purchases. Um, now, that we've, now that we have our, our program identified, now it's time for us to deliver that program so the elected officials and the public can see results of our work. Um, here, I'm going to review um, specific phases of the delivery. Of the delivery, so that includes programming of the funds I just described, administration, pre-construction, uh, right-of-way and utilities, and construction. Uh, so, programming funds. I had talked about looking for schedules and sources of funding. That way, we can actually put priorities and strategies into our program. Uh, with federal funds or, or, or external funds, we have to work with our regional agency, the ARC, to actually program the, those funds into the Transportation Improvement Program, or the TIP. Uh, so the TIP is essentially a one-page project sheet where it outlines what the project is, an identifying number, a, a description, a schedule, the phases, and the funding sources for those phases. 
tips that we have is to consistently coordinate uh, staff with, uh, in our case, ARC or your regional transportation planning agency, and with the GDOT since they are the oversee or the oversight of federal funds. Uh, we work to diligently report changes to the ARC and GDOT in terms of cost and schedule. And also we regularly monitor and report progress to avoid issues as the project progresses. Um, for one of the slides earlier, I was showing a, a, new, um, a new roadway that was being constructed over the freeway. Um, you can imagine there's a very complex project, very long duration. Uh, with federal funds tied into this project, um, these tips here really helped us inform GDOT and the ARC of expectations. Um, the key there being any, any delays in schedule to construction, so that way they know exactly when funds can be released for future phases. And, as, and also one tip there is that um, what we found was our project was actually $10 million over budget. So we had repurposed funds from our local program, SPLOS, um, to this project. And with the recent um, Debt Ceiling Act with Congress, um, essentially we heard word from DC that they were looking to spend down COVID funds that were set aside that weren't used uh, for transportation purposes, and ARC was able to successfully reallocate $9 million of federal COVID funding into this project. Uh, all that was possible with the consistent collaboration and coordination with ARC. Another aspect is the administration of the project. Uh, so here I'm defining administration as all the legwork needed to develop agreements, execute those agreements, Procure uh, procurement documents, releasing those, selecting con consultants and contractors, and then all the change orders, invoice reviews, and changes to, to contracts involved in that. So at Cobb County, we do have three full-time staff and five consultants to help us with this. Uh, we have many county policies. It's a little bit difficult to see, but on the upper right, we have many county policies to help guide us on procurement and ways to uh, um, administer our projects. Um, tips that we have is to use um, internal templates that you may have as much as possible, so that way legal and internal review is very streamlined in terms of project agreements, consultant agreements, construction contracts. And at Cobb County, we, we use a software called Project View. Um, essentially what we do is we load all project information into the software, and that software is able to electronically interface with consultants and contractors where they can submit invoices and change orders um, through the system, and our staff receives that electronically, and we process everything electronically through the software. Uh, eliminates a lot of paper routing. Um, the next phase is pre-construction, so I define this as all planning efforts and engineering efforts for right-of-way and utility. At Cobb County, we have five full-time staff and three consultants to com help us complete this effort. Uh, once again, we do have Cobb-defined manuals uh, related to pre-construction that we follow. Uh, it's almost like a PDP light, if you will. Uh, tips that we have is to utilize consultants as possible for specific technical expertise. So what we find is when we're, especially for federally funded pro projects and we're completing the, the PDB process, um, sometimes there's questions specifically around NEPA, so certifying it. Uh, that could be sometimes a critical path. Uh, we do use um, Arcadis as our consultant uh, to help us answer any questions and certify it uh, environmentally for NEPA. Um, at Cobb County, we have developed a manual and a, and a procedure, a standard operating procedure to use Bluebeam software. Um, so that's a software where you can load PDF plans into it and route it um, internally amongst your staff, as well as to consultants, where um, several divisions of comments appear as layers, and that way um, all comments are kind of together and streamlined in one uh, file. And at Cobb County, we also recommend um, posting a schedule. So what we do is any request for proposal or request for qualification, any need that we see, we'll post it on our county website up front with the preliminary schedule. So even if a RFP hasn't even been worked on uh, and we know it's upcoming, we post all that on the schedule. That way consultants and vendors are um, aware and kind of prepped versus um, we release an RFP on the street and we don't see a lot of downloads, so we're kind of just calling around to make sure people see it. Uh, hopefully we get um, competitive responses. That, that's been successful for us. Um, after pre-construction comes right away in utilities. 
we have one staff on hand and three consultants for right away, and we use uh, primarily use consultants in entirety for the for utilities coordination. Uh, so once again, Cobb County does have predefined man a predefined manual for the right away phase. So this includes um, reaching out to property owners, negotiations, um, acquiring property as needed, as well as um, entering into uh, either temporary construction easements or permanent easements related for the project. Utilities coordination is just that. We have staff that coordinates with all the utility owners and their staff. Um, early on, we, ha we have a tip to coordinate with them early on. Uh, that way, uh, they can see the pre-construction plans. My staff have told me, a lot of utility staff, um, they can't even really read or even understand what a transportation design plan looks like. So it is helpful to collaborate with them early on to understand the full scope so they understand what their impacts are and help us communicate with uh, their needs and their expectations of that. Um, in Cobb County, um, what we do, uh, in terms of federally funded projects, we typically enter into utility agreements with our providers that sets the scopes of work of what they're supposed to do for our projects so we can complete our projects successfully. Um, in Cobb County, we actually actively review and negotiate with Georgia Power on all the work that they do and all the funds that we need to compensate them with. So what we found in our experience is that this does, this, this does ultimately save project costs um, in the long term. Um, but one risk I will say is that if you're trying to close out a project, um, it does delay the closeout of that project because we have to hold funds um, in the project while we finish our negotiation. So if your finance department is hounding you to close out a project to release funds, um, I would not recommend uh, reviewing and negotiating with Georgia Power. I would just um, pay them for the agreement. Uh, but if your finance department is actively looking for you to save money as much as possible and doesn't really care about projects being open, then I would uh, recommend that for you. And the final um, big ticket stage is construction. So at Cobb County, we have four full-time staff, and we have 10 on-call consultants to help us with the construction. Uh, so construction activities includes uh, managing the contractor, looking at change orders, responding to requests for information, and um, daily inspection. At Cobb County, we have a consultant as our single construction ambassador. So that's our single point of contact between the public and all construction activities. In terms of tips, we have various software that we use um, called OnBase, Plan Grid, and Cartograph. Essentially, all the software en is, uh, enables us to load things onto a tablet so our field staff can do things remotely into the field. So this includes marking plans for change orders, um, um, counting quantities out in the field uh, to check pay items for invoices, as well as storing uh, daily inspection reports. And also, we recommend using drone photography, uh, an example on the lower right, to report out in progress to elected officials. It really, um, it really sets up stage for success. And finally, in terms of future opportunities, um, I see three opportunities for us in terms of program delivery. Um, collabor coll collaboration. Um, I, I would like to regularly review project outcomes, have regular debriefs at the end of each project, so our staff, our consultants, and our contractors, uh, we can identify any lessons and learn from those lessons. Um, I'd like to also set up um, meetings with neighboring agencies as well as with the industry, consultants and contractors, so uh, Cobb County staff is aware of best practices and how we can improve our design and optimize success. Uh, we're always looking to update processes, so this includes updating our standard engineering details and all other manuals and the procedures I had described earlier. And finally, the use of technology. Um, so a picture in the upper right is the use of actually drone photography, where I've seen instead of a van driving every center line mile, um, some agencies have tested using drones with pictures and looking at the cracks and formations to develop their uh, pavement condition index that way and also the use of GIS analysis or computer-aided drafting um, with artificial intelligence. So this is uh, computer scanning, aerial photography, and potentially identifying layers or assets in that, in that photography, or even potentially drawing some base layers for your design. And from there, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Jonathan.
All right, next up we've got Tom Naselki. Tom Naselki, PhD, is currently um, serving as the city's airport assistant uh, general manager for planning and development. In this role, he assists in, um, in overseeing implementation of ATL Next, the Department of Aviation's Capital Development Program. He has worked for the Department of, Avi of Aviation for more than 28 years. Um, Dr. Nasalki is also responsible for the preparation of NEPA documents, um, overseeing the Department of Aviation's environmental compliance progress, and overseeing all environmental planning. Additionally, he is responsible for all airport planning and led the completion of the master plan. Uh, prior to joining the Department of Aviation, he worked at a regional airport planning and design firm. In 1989, Dr. Nasalki completed his undergraduate degree in civil engineering from the University of Utah. After moving to Atlanta, he attended the Georgia Institute of Technology and earned his MSCE in 1991 and his PhD in civil engineering in 1994. Dr. Nasalki, please. All right, good morning. Um, so Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport Yeah, that works. Okay. Um, I assume most people are familiar with the Atlanta airport. Probably flown through a couple times. Okay, very good. So you're aware of its uh, strengths and its weaknesses. Um, so world's busiest airport. Um, 2019, we handled 110 million passengers. Um, in calendar year 2023, we're going to be over 100 million. So we're, we're just about back from a passenger perspective. Um, it's a pretty big place. We've got five runways, uh, 196 gates. When I say gate, that's not, that does not include hard standing or remote positions. That's an actual um, gate with a passenger boarding bridge. That's definitely the most in the country. Uh, we're spread across two terminals, the domestic terminal and the international terminal, and between them there are seven concourses. The, uh, the majority of the airport and its cur or the, the terminal area in its current location opened in September of 1980. We've added other things along the way, like concourse E or the international terminal and of course F that was in 2012 and uh, but the place you know a lot of passengers a lot of activity older systems we um, spent a lot of time replacing systems but also um, addressing other com uh, airport components from a capacity perspective as, it, as they get um, thoroughly tested for example such as our security checkpoints and so right now we've got um, and we're still <laughs> Still working on defining it, but we're, our, our capital program now has been updated to at least about a $10 billion, $10 billion program. So then that kind of, you know, starts to beg the question, well, how, how, do, we, how do we implement a $10 billion capital program, um, which right now we're trying to target $800, to a billion, $800 million to a billion dollars of work per year. Uh, in, in fiscal year 23, which just ended for us uh, in June, we're, we're up to about, we did about $640 million worth of, worth of work. So uh, we're pretty happy with that, um, but we, we know we're, we're, we got a lot more planned on the horizon, especially for this coming fiscal year. So we got to, you know, continue to be able to implement all that work. So it begs the question, how do we do it? Um, I'll get to some examples here in a minute, but I'll just go right to some of the, uh, the stable of, of firms and teams that we have at our disposal. We have... Uh, four what we call on-call um, construction manager at risk teams. We have four what we call managing general contractor teams. Those are for smaller smaller projects, which we'll get to that in a second, what is smaller. Uh, three architectural teams uh, for design purposes. Two civil design teams. We just hired four small architectural and engineering teams. Uh, as I looked at the list of seminar sponsors out front, uh, a, lot, a, lot of those, a lot of those firms are doing work at the airport but we want to see more. We want to see more of you doing work at the airport. Um, and so we're um, do, doing work at the airport is, is very, I think it's very satisfying. It's also very lucrative, but it's also very challenging. The airport's a very challenging place to work, especially if you're working inside, designing and constructing inside the security identification display area. Um, so just real quickly, I want to talk about just future opportunities. We've got, we're going to be soliciting in the next couple of months for another what we call large A&E team. Um, and then 
the current R and E A uh, and E teams, some of their contracts will be expiring, so we'll be going back out on the street for the for those those contracts. So please um, please monitor the city's Department of Procurement website. That's where we do all of our advertising for all of our teams, um, and the projects that we do. They range in value from fifty thousand dollars to one point three billion dollars. So I'm um, so I'm going to just quickly now run through how we how we do our work in, in project delivery because we we use different different methods depending upon the type of project, where it's located, degree of complexity, as well as how much interaction does that project have with aircraft, vehicles, or passengers. So um, in general, when it comes to vertical work, we'll use, in general, this is our general rule of thumb, there are always exceptions, but for projects up to $10 million, we'll use what we call our managing general contract. So if we have a, a, a parking lot that has to be rebuilt, or if we have to relocate a section of sanitary sewer pipe, whatever, um, we'll use one of those ma managing general contractors. So again, we've got four of those teams. Um, they'll do basically work up to $10 million. If we start to increase in value, from 10 to $75 million, that's when we'll use one of our on-call construction manager at risk team. The way we use construction manager at risk is not really to you know, transfer the risk to the CMAR. What we really use it for is to get someone on board and work with them and use them for flexibility. Um, because the airport is so dynamic and there's so much stuff going on, sometimes we have to change, we have to change sequence or other aspects of the project on the fly. So by using that, that construction manager at risk, we're able to do that without having to go back to city council for change orders. Things. So um, that's when we will use an on, one of our on-call construction manager at risk teams. For the bigger projects, say $75 million or more, that's when we're going to put it out on the street. So um, that's for vertical work. When it comes to flat work, primarily airfield work, or um, yeah, primarily airfield work, we're just going to go with design, bid, build. We're very good at it. We feel very comfortable with it, but we also have to have a complete design if you're doing work on the airfield. The phasing at times is going to be um, too complex to do a design build. Uh, yeah, on the airfield, aesthetics aren't that important, but we have to, we have, to have the phasing tied down. There's, there's too much at risk. Uh, you know, Delta Airlines, they run, their world, they run the world's biggest hub at the, at the Atlanta airport. We always make sure that they're on board with what we're doing. We spend a lot of time Coordinating, um, coordinating with Delta, um, but we do, we have used other 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 methods um, for our Sky Train. That's the train that connects the domestic terminal over the rental car center. We did that with a um, design, build, operate, maintain. Uh, in that case, we wanted to have the train the train operator also operate and maintain that train going forward. Um, for the I two eighty five structures, that's that's taking I two eighty five. I'm sorry, the fifth runway across I two eighty five. We went. We went design build on that one. That was our first one. That was back in the 2000, 2003 time frame, um, and that that worked well. We learned a lot about design build, especially for the unintended consequences that can be accompanied with design build. And then for the plane train tunnel west extension, that's a project that's going underground. Um, that's going on right now underground. Uh, we went with pro progressive design build. We do a lot of different types of work: runways, buildings, parking decks, whatever but we don't do tunneling. We've never done a tunneling, a true tunneling project. And so that's where, um, especially designing one, so that's where we went with um, the use of progressive design build, hand it off to a team that will do the design and, and have CMR uh, type uh, responsibilities. Overall, that approach has gone very well for us. So let's just go look at some other, other projects going on and how, we've, uh, how we're delivering them. Um, Modernizing the main checkpoint, main security checkpoint right now that's got 18 lanes. We're swapping out all the equipment for uh, the latest uh, CT equipment. Um, some of you may notice that going through that, that checkpoint may actually be a little slower, but I promise you this, it is more secure. Once the TSA makes this, this software upgrade that we think is coming, it's going to greatly finally speed up processing through that checkpoint. I'm just going to ask you to be patient when going through the uh, main checkpoint. But yeah, that was design, bid, build. All in, that is, yes, about $64 million. Uh, we're getting ready, or we're actually in the process now to start upgrading the cell, the cellular system at the airport from 4G to 5G. Um, this is going to be definitely the largest installation in the country. It's uh, been very interesting thus far, but this one is design build. 
Um, aesthetics aren't important to us in this case. It's just run the conduit, run the containment, I'm sorry, run the, run the containment, run the fiber, and put in a couple thousand antennas all over um, the Central Pass Terminal Complex. Uh, $143 million, a little more than that. Um, on this one, modern air cargo, the site preparation, uh, if you look on the, south, the southwest side of the airfield, you'll notice this big, big pile of dirt out there. Well, it's a lot more than a big pile of dirt, but we're, we're preparing the area for um, additional cargo facilities. Um, one interesting aspect of that is when the developer comes in, they're going to need someone to, um, to design, uh, design the buildings. I know they've got a design team. I don't know who else they'll be hiring, but um, right now we're negotiating with AeroTurn to get them, um, they're, they're the third party that will develop those buildings. Just the site preparation alone is, it'll come out around $185 million. Plane Train Tunnel West Extension, um, basically what we're doing there is, I won't go into all the detail, but we are moving the turn back location from before the baggage claim station to after the baggage claim station. That will allow headways to decrease between trains and um, have greater throughput, about 20, we expect a 20% um, uh, 20 percent passenger um, increase per direction per hour, so um, plane train capacity will uh, will go up by moving that that turn back. Um, it's been an incredible project. Uh, you can see there, 296 million dollars um, for the for that extension. Here's the uh, the bifurcation, um, but it's 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 been very very interesting project. Out of the public eye. It's been amazing how much blasting has been going on underground with no no impact to uh, to the domestic terminal. Concourse D widening. Now this is the biggest one we got going on. This is a real beast. Um, so this one is going to be is uh, construction manager at risk. Um, conceptually, we are widening concourse D. Concourse D is the narrowest concourse. It's a it's 60 feet wide. We're going to widen it to 99 feet. But you know, ideally, we would just you know knock down half the concourse, replace it at a time, knock down the other half. Delta wasn't going to go along with that. Can't blame them because it would take out a lot of gates. Um, eventually, we 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 arrived at 99 foot width, maximum number of gates that we can take out of service. Would be. So we're going to be widening this concourse. It's a lot more than just widening because um, we're actually, as you can see here. You got concourse. You got two levels here. The, the the lower level is the apron level. We're not we're not going to we're going to leave the apron level intact, even though it's going to get spaces get rearranged. The existing concourse will actually be will actually be demolished. We're going to come in first of all with a large frame that will go over the concourse, and then we're going to start collectively demoing it uh, every night, taking it out bit by bit, so that. Instead of having a 60-foot wide concourse with 11-foot ceiling, we'll have a 99-foot wide concourse, 14-foot ceilings on the edge, 18 in the middle. So it's going to be, it'll be an amazing facility, but it's going to take a long time to get there as we see completion in 2020. Um, here are a couple of facts about what we're doing. 18 feet in the middle, it's 14 feet ceiling height on the ends. Um, so concourse D is, is so, it's just so tiny. Why is it tiny? It's a long, it's a long history regarding the, the carriers that funded it initially, but now much larger airplanes are out there, very tight for the passengers. The only way you can provide a, a reasonable level of service for passengers is just provide more area to spread out. So we'll have more floor air area for hold rooms, more concessions, much larger restrooms um, especially. Hopefully, okay, so got another rendering here of what, you'll, what it's gonna be like. There'll be a you know, couple columns um, in there, but it's just going to be a much wider, wide open, um, wide open concourse. And how do I get the video to play? Or can you do that? <laughs> yeah, I wish I, I wish I knew how. Anywhere. Or or. All right, okay. So um, one thing that we're doing, just, just real quick, um, is when it comes to the construction of this con of the widening, we're going to use modular construction. And so um, 
we're just going to see a little little rendering here, and then we're going to talk about the modules. The modules for one side of the concourse will be built off site. They will then be in, on the south side of the airfield, what we're calling the modular yard or mod yard for short. Um, those modules will then be brought across the airfield. The longest one, I believe, is going to be 196 feet long. And they will be trucked across the airfield and then placed. This has been done at, at uh, Dallas Fort Worth. We're doing it next. Now, if some of you may see in some of the trade publications, LAX is talking about, oh, they're the first. They're not the first. They're going to be the third. But so here, here these modules are now being constructed um, on the south side of the airfield. Um, and what's interesting is they will be, you know, all, all uh, steel, glass will be put in, and some of, the, some of the interior stuff, and then the rest of it will be finished over uh, at Concourse D. So here's a, a Mamoet uh, mover that's going to a self-propelled modular transporter that will um, pick it up. It will move across the airfield at one mile an hour, and it will be done uh, at night. So we'll, you know, we'll shut down the, the two middle runways and then just walk with this thing. I can hardly wait to get out there and go walk with it. But, um, and this, obviously this is very, very simplified, but um, it will come out, go across the airfield. Now what's very interesting is um, the grades on a runway or taxiway. You got a one, uh, one and a half percent crown. And so if you think about, it, you're taking this massive, massive thing across the airfield, there is some up and down. And so that, this, this, this transporter has to adjust, be able to account for that, 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 that has to constantly level the building. Otherwise, that building's going to get torqued up and glass will shatter. So anyway, so here it is. It's coming into Concourse D. And um, it's gonna, it, it, it can just make this 90-degree turn, I guess, just by turning its wheels. Come in, drop it in. And then um, we're going to do it. I think the, the final count is going to be somewhere between 10 and 14 miles. So you can see the modules will be used here on the east side. We're going to then um, stick build the north extension and then come back and then stick build the rest of the widening. And that is that. Okay. There we go. Okay. Just real quick here. Um, other projects that we've got coming up. Um, digital upgrade of our uh, closed circuit uh, TV um, set up our network for security purposes. That's going to be about $60 million. We've got thousands of cameras that we have to, um, that we have to update. Ramp 6 North, we're adding four gates at Ramp 6 North. That was just bid. It's, um, that contract is in execution right now. That's uh, design, bid, build also. Got federal money in that one. That's our first time to put federal money into something that is vertical or non-airfield. That's ninety-eight million dollars. We're going to be replacing um, power distribution on Concourse E. That is, that's going to be a very interesting project. That will be designed bid build as well. Um, Concourse E is two point four million square feet. It's electrically it's very different than the rest of the um, the buildings. It's got unit substations and then complex distribution downstream from there. The other one we're getting okay. So as a passenger. South side is going to radically change. The south economy lot will be going away at the end of the year. We're going to be coming in and building 6,500 stall parking deck in the south economy lot. Please be prepared for that. Um, after the south deck is completed, this new south deck, the existing south deck will be demolished. So parking, parking is going to continue to be a struggle at the airport um, over the next, or I should say a challenge, um, over the next over the, over the next few years. Another one there. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.
Next up, we've got Tom Seaver with um, Gwinnett County Department of Transportation. He is the Assistant Director um, for Gwinnett County DOT. Um, in this role, Tom supports the county staff that are responsible for the maintenance and operations of over 750 traffic signals and the county's advanced transportation management system um, over, oh, okay, okay, okay. Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> Tom, uh, what did your, Georgia Tech um, for a bachelor's in civil engineering after working uh, in the private sector for a few years, he joined Gwinnett County in 2020, or 2000, I'm sorry, in 2000, and has served in various roles um, before being promoted as assistant director in late 2020. There's the 2020. <laughs> Tom is a PE and has been a member of Georgia ITE and a past president as well. Um, Tom and his wife, Reverend Tracy Siever, are the proud parents of two emerging adults, Austin and Wesley. All right. Okay, I can't. Uh, the benefit of nearsighted. Also means I can't see the grimaces on your faces as I go through this, so that's good for me. Um, well, good morning. Thank you all for coming to the last session. Uh, I appreciate it. For Jonathan and Tom, appreciate it. Um, with Jonathan, you got to hear what's going on on the north west side of town on I-75. Things are doing up in Cobb County. He gave a great overview of the program delivery process. Then you go down to the airport. Um, we want to catch Howard still, but we never will. So that's okay. Um, and and Gwinnett, talk about our airport. And you got to hear uh, different types of project delivery. Construction manager at risk, design build, design bid build, and others. So I'm going to take a little different approach with ours, talking about uh, how we deliver the program in Gwinnett County. Um, i got to give you a quick overview of our department. Um, then I'll follow that up with a, a brief history of the splost in Gwinnett County. I'll give you kind of where we are on the 2017 program, which just ended. Uh, I need to talk about our Citizens Project Selection Committee, how we come up with the projects that go in the program. And I'll give you a quick overview of the 23 program starting from um, it worked. Okay. Um, so we maintain a lot of infrastructure, kind of like Cobb County. We got over 2,600 miles of roadway, 2,500 miles of sidewalk, uh, not as many bridges, fortunately, um, but a lot of traffic signs, uh, traffic signals, cameras to support our traffic management center. Uh, probably traffic control center that has a traffic manager. Um, our airport's only 500 acres with one runway. Um, we have a transit system uh, called Ride Gwinnett, and that will be expanding come August uh, 28th with uh, three new local routes and two micro transit zones. We're excited about that. Um, and then in our department, uh, we have uh, eight divisions and a few sections underneath those to maintain that infrastructure. We'll be talking about program delivery today. So like Cobb, we have a pre-construction group who goes through the plans and the plan development, uh, NEPA documents, uh, and right away uh, construction. They're the team that manages it with the assistance of a lot of contractors and consultants. And then uh, Ride Gwinnett, as I mentioned, they have a capital team that they're going to be uh, take care of procuring buses. They're going to be expanding our transit center at Gwinnett Place. Uh, we were fortunate enough to just receive a raise grant uh, towards that project. And then we have the operations team. Uh, in uh, Gwinnett, we have a contractor that runs the system, and uh, so our team manages that contractor and makes sure they're performing to the Gwinnett standard. Uh, we have our airport with only seven employees. Uh, we have support from Michael Baker International as our contract management out there. Uh, going down to the bottom, we have our roadway maintenance and operations. I do all the work supporting that uh, right-of-way and roadways in the county. Uh, traffic management, um, Kristen Phillips runs uh, over that team, and uh, so they manage all the traffic signals, and then traffic safety as well, uh, where we look at any opportunities to improve, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the project programs they have. And then lastly, we have our finance and performance management division who make sure that we're not overspending our funds, but also paying invoices in a timely manner. I'm sure everybody on the private side appreciates that in this room. Um, so, program in SPLOS. Our first SPLOS was 1985. That funded the construction of the Gwinnett Justice and Administration Center in Lawrenceville. Uh, so, the next SPLOS in uh, the 98 program was the first one to fund transportation projects in Gwinnett. And so, uh, and then fast forward to 1997. That was the first time we had our Citizens Project Selection Committee. 
And uh, the reason we had that, that was because we had an unsuccessful referendum the year before. So in the retooling, that was one of the things we identified was to give citizens that opportunity for input on the projects that would be in the program. Uh, in 2001 was the first time we shared funds with the cities. Um, uh, the next, I think later, like 2005, that became a mandate from the state legislature that SPLOS funds be shared with cities, but we were uh, in ahead of that in 2001. And if you really want a lot more details, here's the link. Go check it out on the Gwinnett County website. But uh, since 1985, our SPLOS programs in Gwinnett have raised over $4 billion for capital improvements. So that's quite a, a success, I would say, and uh, has saved the county a lot of money in borrowing and bond costing over the years. The 2017 program, like I mentioned, we just finished collections back in uh, March 31st. Um, you can see here the different categories. I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, I'll, take, I'll linger on the capital projects rehab and resurfacing. This is the, the money we use to pay for resurfacing our roadways. Uh, that 2,600 miles, most of those are subdivision streets. But they do degrade over time and have to be resurfaced. And so this is the money that's uh, allocated to that out of that program. And I'll talk about what we did in the coming program. And then we had uh, 30 million dedicated to city county projects. So we worked in the partnership with our 16, 16 cities in Gwinnett County. Be glad it's only seven, Jonathan. Um, and uh, so good partners, a lot of good projects inside of those city limits. Um, I'll also talk about the tier one and tier two you see here. Uh, we take a fi financially conservative approach in Gwinnett. So we have the projections on what the loss is it going to generate over its duration, and we take 90% of those funds, and that's tier one. We feel confident that we will be able to deliver the projects that are identified as tier one projects in spite of any maybe unexpected recessions or other things that might impact collections over the time frame. For our 2009 program, that was a very good thing because there was a big recession, <laughs> as we all know. Um, so then um, we have tier two, that's the other 10% of the projected revenues. And then actually for the 2017 program, we actually were fortunate enough to have over collections because the economy has been so good the past several years. So here's kind of a breakdown of the overall 23 SPLOS program for Gwinnett. Our anticipated revenues for six years is $1.336 billion. That's a lot of money, not airport money, but a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> So, um, and then the state uh, law of force plus, they have a tier one designation. That means that that's money that comes off the very top for a project that benefits everyone in the county. Uh, for this one, it's only 12 and a half million. So that comes off the top, then you do split by uh, cities and counties. You can see it goes down to about 992 million for the county over six years. The cities get just over 331 million. Uh, and that's divided based on population. Uh, and then of the county portion, we were fortunate enough to receive 73% of that, so over $736 million over six years. Um, for resurfacing for the next six years, we identified a need to uh, maintain our payment condition at about where it is today as an overall average. We needed $200 million, so we said we need $200 million off the top for that part of the program. I actually had a resident who told me, I will not vote for SPLOS because that's what you do. I'm like, we agree it needs to be maintained, right? He's like, yeah, but you shouldn't take it out of that. That's for capital improvements. I'm like, I didn't tell him your millage rate would probably go up two mills and your property taxes would increase a lot if, if we didn't do it this way. Um, but so that's how we do it in Gwinnett to pay for our resurfacing program. So that left us with $536 million for the next six years of projects. And again, we divide it up in tier one and tier two. So I talked about the CPSC. Uh, and here's kind of the schedule this uh, group uh, uh, followed over the past, over six months. Um, these are 15 individuals appointed by our Board of Commissioners. Um, and we provided a lot of information to them. And you can see, actually before election, before the referendum was approved, we started meetings and even set the amount in the categories that I'll talk about in a minute. So then we had a successful referendum and then we went through and did all the categories, identified the projects that would be in those, and so how that funding that they had available would be used. And this is how our residents uh, have uh, input. Also, these are open meetings, so the public can show up, lobby for an improvement in their neighborhood they want to see done, or in their area. I shouldn't say in their neighborhood. We don't do a ton of things in subdivisions other than resurfacing. No, that's a whole other conversation. Um, 
So they go through, so October to the end of March, we had meetings with the CPSC about every two weeks. And then we presented it to our board in April and they approved it uh, June 6th, um, the project list that I'll talk about. And these are the members of our CS CPSC. Um, we have uh, elected official, former elected official, planning commissioner, and uh, because of the great work this did, uh, one of these individuals got elected to the State Transportation Board uh, for District 6. So uh, you get a very interesting mix of in individuals, uh, varying interests, but ultimately they came together and developed a great program. We look forward to delivering. So here's the categories. We have bridges, culverts and drainage. We have intersections, major roads, residential speed control, road safety and alignment, school safety, sidewalk trails and pedestrian safety, transportation planning and unpaved roads. Um, again, 200 million was set aside and we divided up in tier one and tier two. Um, like I said, Jonathan gave a great overview of program delivery. So um, we have a team that manages the pre-construction component we have people that manage the right-of-way, along with consultant help from Atlas. And then we move into construction. Again, Atlas is our program manager, and they help us with the construction management uh, of the process. And um, you've heard about the different delivery methods at the airport. These are things we're looking at, how we can incorporate those in the coming program. So we're excited to look at new ways to get things done, as opposed to traditional design bid build. Um, this team is also responsible for our planning efforts, so we're actively uh, completing the Comprehensive Transportation Plan up for, update for Gwinnett County, um, and then also utility permitting um, and development review is another big component of what our uh, program delivery team does to make sure these things are going on and are coordinated with our projects, but also we know what's going in the ground when we get ready to do the next project. So real quickly, I'll go through the different categories, um, and then we'll, I guess we'll wrap up for questions. Um, so here the CPSC recommended $3.14 million, and these are used uh, traditionally for our speed hump program to install new speed humps in subdivisions uh, and other residential streets, but we've expanded into the digital signs here, giving drivers feedback on their speeds uh, over the time, and then what we want to do over the next six years is look for other opportunities to increase safety along our roadways and to have traffic calming, not just on residential, but on other types of roadways. And this, the, this is a great program. It's been around for about 30 some years now. And uh, we've seen a drastic increase actually in the last few years. We made some changes in our uh, policies that actually allowed a lower le level of signatures by the citizens to get speed humps in their subdivisions. So that has made a tremendous difference. And we've seen a great increase in people pursuing these. Uh, transportation planning, almost $10 million for Tier 1. Um, we do a lot of partnership planning efforts with ARC, with our cities, with our community improvement districts to come up with different things in those areas. Again, the comprehensive plan is funded out of this funding as well. Uh, we'll ha use these opportunities for uh, concepts or feasibility studies for different projects. And then grant opportunities. Uh, I need to take a moment here. I uh, mentioned the raise grant we had earlier. But we've also been successful pursuing um, a create Safe Streets for All grant, where we used to develop our action plan. Uh, and then we also were successful in uh, receiving a SMART grant, which we'll use for some improvements on Singleton Road related to pedestrian safety and, uh, and uh, transit accessibility on that corridor with technology. And um, we foresee, with the current bipartisan infrastructure law, continued opportunities. So having Funding here in transportation planning allows us to reach out to some of our partners in the uh, consulting community to help us develop the applications and, and meet the quality. And we've, we've been successful um, here recently with uh, four actual awards, and we're excited about it. And we know there's just continued opportunities coming. So we wanted that funding available to continue to pursuing those, and we look forward to achieving those documents as well. Unpaved roads. Believe it or not, Gwinnett County has about 43 unpaved roads, about 20 miles of unpaved roads still left. Um, so we designated about just over $2 million to install what we call triple treatment on these unpaved roads. It's a mix of uh, asphaltic tar, gravel, sand, and it puts a much harder surface that lasts longer than uh, just gravel and dirt. And so over the next six years, we hope to get all these roads treated and get them more stabilized and hopefully decrease our maintenance responsibilities. 
So now I'm going to move into some other categories, but these all go through a selection process. We have a number of different projects that are recommended to us from citizens over the years, and that's our universe of projects you see in the, the one ball here. And then we take a lot of data, we do some analysis, accidents, traffic volumes, other things. And then I mentioned community input earlier. So all that comes in together, goes to the CPSC, and then they ultimately give us project recommendations. So first category, school safety. Um, we have over $16 million was dedicated to that. Um, 10 specific projects, as well as we can identify kind of some uh, opportunities for future needs to address those. Since it is a six-year program, there are things we hadn't anticipated that we'll need to address as we get later in the program. So those are like if the Board of Education in Gwinnett County decides to build a new school, we have some set-aside funds to do some improvements for that new school. Um, we continue to see challenges at some of our existing schools with traffic demand uh, related to parent pickup and drop-off. Um, or other needs, so we have, a, uh, as those needs are identified in the next few years, we can uh, pursue improvements. And then you can see here several different uh, specific locations we, we're going to pursue, and these are scattered around the county, uh, to make improvements for access, pedestrian safety, uh, and just otherwise make things better. Um, here, sidewalks, trails, and pedestrian safety. Um, over $57 million and then another $8 million in Tier 2. This is the largest dedication of funding in our SPLOS program towards pedestrian safety uh, to date. So uh, it shows a definite commitment um, by our residents to see these improvements, and we look forward to making those happen. And again, we also have four project areas that give us some flexibility throughout the life of the program. So we have our gap fill, uh, subdivisions or developments occur, you get different pieces, we connect the pieces with our gap fill program. Sometimes we have to go through and rehab it to make it uh, proper width. Uh, we also have to add pedestrian crossings for safety purposes. You know, it could be an RFB, a pedestrian hyper beacon, or other methods to alert people. Um, we are looking at our major activity centers, Gas South, District, uh, around the Mall of Georgia, things like that that are continuing to grow and, and have needs for pedestrian facilities that we need to address. More lighting just for pedestrian purposes, so people can walk on the side, sidewalk or on the edge of the road and feel much safer. But we also have 42 specific projects identified, along with five more uh, Tier 2 funded projects. Um, road safety and alignment. Uh, these are locations where we have an accident history or a bad skew on an intersection. Uh, other things that need to be addressed, almost 50 million, or $48 million for that. And we also, oh, sorry. We set aside some spot improvements. Again, six-year program, things may, a development may occur and create an issue in uh, two or three years. So we want to be able to come back and have flexibility. Um, you've got a mix of locations here. Uh, focus on the Harbin's one on the bottom left. Uh, today, they're activating three new signals along that section of Harbin's Road. And, but they're not adding turn lanes or any other improvements, just signals for safety for uh, exiting the side streets. Now, many of you know, you go on a state route, they're going to want you to put in turn lanes or do other improvements to go along with that traffic signal. So this project was identified saying, we're going to do something quick with a signal to get them a safer access out of these side streets. But that's not the best long-term solution unless we go back and add turn lanes or other things like that, or we could put in a roundabout and take out the traffic signal and have that traffic calming effect that the roundabout can create. So this gives us the funding to go back and do that. Uh, the one below at Hutchins at Oak, that's a skew intersection, and this would be a good opportunity to improve that. Um, and the other projects are just uh, different um, types of improvements. Again, it can range from a traffic signal with turn lanes to the roundabout to, to other realignment. Um, bridges and culverts, almost $57 million there. And these range from just rehabilitation to extend the life of a bridge to uh, Time we have to do transportation drainage improvements. About five of these projects are bridges that the sufficiency rating is getting lower and need to be replaced over time. And But then three I'll focus on, the, the three at CSX Railroad locations, Arcata Road, Hosea Road, and Oak and Gloucester Road. We were successful in receiving a uh, crossing elimination grant from the Federal Rail Administration through USDOT. Um, and this will be used to study these locations, develop the alternative, but then we have the funding in SPLOS to move forward with preliminary design now. Uh, 
everybody knows bridges are expensive and crossing a railroad is in coordination. Uh, it takes time, so this at least gets us going. And then if we pursue another referendum in six years, hopefully we can get, identify the construction dollars or maybe we can get federal uh, construction dollars again from the crossing elimination uh, pot of money. So uh, we'll look at those. And then also the bottom one, major crossings of 85, there's an ongoing I-85 uh, planning and environmental linkages study, or PELS, and Arcadis and Kim Lee Horn are leading those efforts. And so we wanted to have some opportunity as that's wrapping up to start moving forward with projects that are identified in that study. So moving on, uh, intersections, almost $90 million towards intersections in Tier 1. We identified a number of projects. Uh, this is actually the category that funds our traffic signals and ATMS improvements. We also had to look at quick, quick fix projects for queuing lane extensions. Uh, we heard about quick response projects from the district engineers earlier. We tried to do something similar. Fortunately, we don't have a $200,000 cap, so we can <laughs> get a little bit bigger project if we need to. Um, but these are just, again, scattered around the, the county as identified needs. And last category is our uh, major roads category. Uh, building a big road takes a lot of money, so it has the most funding at all over $177 million. And uh, again, we created a, a pot for as our major activity centers change over the next few years. We have some opportunities to step in there. Uh, crossings of 85 are expensive, so we identified some additional funding in this category to go towards those. And then we also have included some uh, other areas around the county to make sure we can improve things. So, and all these take data. So we provide a lot of data to the CPSC, we have, and then these are ultimately what they decided. So citizens have the opportunity to provide input. They developed the program with input from us, and this is what we're going to deliver over the next six years. And realistically, some of these will take longer. You talk about going through uh, federal funding. It takes a little bit of time to get through the plan development process. So uh, realistically, I don't think we'll close out the 23 program until 2033, just because it just takes time. But I went too fast, I'm sorry. But we have about five minutes or so for questions, I guess. So Victoria, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. All right, thank you. We do have five minutes. We have a microphone here. Um, and if there are any questions in the audience, please step up to the microphone and go ahead and ask them. Any questions? All right. Go are you ahead. ready? All right. Tom, how do you reconcile your CTP project list with your citizens project list? Do they kind of marry and go hand in hand? Or do the citizens, do they follow the C, your CTP? I'm just wondering about that relationship, or do they just do whatever ever they want? Do they have any kind of, you, right. you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I understand. Okay. Um, if we had our CTP done when we started the process, that would have been helpful, but we did not. So we try to coordinate as much as we can, and what will, since we're on the back end of the CTP, what we did was we looked at the short-term projects in the CTP, and made sure that there was a consistency between what the citizens recommended for the SPLOST and what would be short-term in the uh, CTP program. Does that make sense? My, my advice would be get your CTP done in advance and then go to your CPSC. But. Uh, yes, this is directed for anyone. Um, so with the rise in construction costs in the last couple of years, how have you guys prepared some of those project budgets for, for SPLOST? I guess I got the mic. Um, yes, we've seen the increase, and so we've had to uh, look at opportunities. Sometimes those uh, pots of money I talked about, we've had to shift funding out of those into specific projects to address the, the increase in costs. Um, I would say for Cobb County, it's a difficult balance because um, we the budgets are named and called out in the county SPLOS booklet, and those are ceilings for us. Um, luckily for Cobb County, we have budgets typically identified in components. So for example, Tom mentioned resurfacing. Uh, we just say we're gonna do $225 million of resurfacing. Um, what the public doesn't know is that we're doing less and less mileage because of the rise in costs. I think in Cobb County, we're fortunate that um, Tom, uh, Tom mentioned revenues, uh, sales tax collected. So in Cobb County, I think we were um, very conservative in our, in our forecast because we're seeing about 70% 
our collections are 70% over the forecast. So what that, for what Cobb County does is that if we project, say, $1 billion of collection um, in six years, um, let's just say we get a, actually a $1 billion collected in five years. So what that means in, at the five-year mark, we actually go back to our board and reallocate what we think will be future funds. And that's when um, we're gathering all the data to say why we need money for repaving, because construction costs were 30% over what we, what we thought. So at the airport, we, um, we, we are not, we don't have to, I should say we don't have to worry, but we, we don't, we don't um, use any taxpayer funds. So I want to make sure everyone knows that. Um, it's something that people don't understand. Because we use uh, either airport uh, internally, rate, uh, internally generated revenue, leases from tenants, as well as uh, federal grants. But um, so we do have a little more flexibility. But yeah, we we track in, we track uh, inflation monthly. Uh, additionally, if we have to maybe descope something to try to keep keep the project within um, our allocated budget, sometimes we'll have to rearrange money, go steal something from over here, you know, delay something to, to build something that we need now to make, and make sure that it is fully funded. So we, um, even though we deal with a lot of money, we still, we, we, we are scrambling to, to get funding as well as c constantly reprioritize projects. But fortunately, we, when it comes to reprioritization, we pr pretty much just deal with our airlines because they have to put a lot of money into the projects as well. We have time for one more question. A quick one, quick one. Uh, the airport, uh, that south terminal is, it can be a challenge at times. So that parking project, is that going to be uh, all at once or is it going to be phased in? So um, before we start the, the new south parking deck, the, all the existing deck parking will be restored. So we're, we're finishing up um, a deck, uh, uh, deck restoration rehabilitation on the north deck. That will be, that will be completed. And then we're going to go in and take the entire South Economy lot. So that'll be about 3,500 stalls that will come out of, um, of circulation. Um, when that deck gets completed, there'll be 6,500 put back. We'll then demolish the South deck. We'll re reconstruct, a, I'll just say, a, that deck in a, in a slightly different form. Um, and then 2030, 2031, we'll demo the North deck and, re and replace it. So. Um, in the meantime, though, we're also looking at uh, expanding the international um, international park ride deck over on the east side. So we're going to be adding more structured parking um, on the on the east side of the airport for for access into the into the international terminal. So just please bear with us. Um, th those parking decks are um, at the domestic terminal. They're over 40 years old. As you can imagine, they've been cash cows for us because they've been paid off for years and years and years. And so now we're going to have to take on a lot more debt uh, to, um, to reconstruct those, but um, we, we know they're desperately needed. They're, they're big income generators for us, as you can imagine. All right, thank you very much to our presenters, and I'll hand it off to, uh, to Alex. All right, well, you guys don't have to worry about a speech from me. I just wanted to get up here for just a minute, and on behalf of all the committee members involved with the conference this year, I just want to say thank you for those of you attending in person, moderators, presenters, uh, virtually, and just, again, for bringing your families. I think that's what makes this conference so great is the ability to come down here. I think Robinson and some others have mentioned just kids growing up together and, you know, getting beat by Steve Henry and Shane and Cornhole and hearing about their, you know, 10-year journey or, or whatever. But um, that's what I want to do. I want to get up here and just say thank you guys. Y'all make this possible. I look forward to having you guys back next year. I think it's July 21st through the 24th. Um, just some closing housekeeping items. PDHs are all out on the front table um, for CM credits. If you missed a sign-in sheet or something like that, please be sure to do that. Um, and give Bing a hug or a high five on the way out. This, this conference has been great. Has been great. Uh, the branding, all the work for the conference. So just thank you guys so much.